Well, this is Christmas Eve here at Madariville Assembly of God. We wish you a very blessed Christmas. We know that some of you are enjoying this time with family and friends and loved ones. Some of you may even feel like you're alone at this time, but friends, if you're a child of God, you are never alone. Uh, the Christ that was born so many years ago is alive and well, and he'll minister to you today by the Holy Spirit wherever you are. I want to read a very, very familiar portion of scripture today. Uh, the Christmas story as found in the Gospel of Luke. I wish that my daughter were here today. Uh, this is their year to go with her in-laws for Christmas, and I'm happy about that. They're wonderful people. But I miss her for a number of reasons. One is that from the time she was a toddler, she was an early reader, uh, but she had the task of reading the Christmas story from the Gospel of Luke before we begin any of our activities on Christmas Day uh, there as a family. So I wish she were here today to read this, but I'm going to be reading from Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, words that you've heard all of your life if you're a child of God. It came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, every one into his own city, and Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and light him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Well, I want to speak to you for a little while today on the paradox of Christmas. You may or may not be familiar with that word paradox. It means something that might not mean or it might not make sense in the natural. It might seem like a contradiction of terms. Uh, somebody said that the term jumbo shrimp is a paradoxical statement. There are many seemingly uh, contradictory statements in the Word of God or statements that don't seem to make sense in the natural. Let me give you just a few examples. Philippians 1, 21 says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. How could dying be gain? Uh, you know, the Bible speaks of losing our life that we might gain eternal life. That seems a contradiction in the natural, but friends, it's very, very true. Here's another. We only gain by giving. That does not seem to be true in the natural, but it's very true in the word of God. Luke 6, 38, give and it shall be given unto you. That's just the opposite way. We think that we gain by, by hoarding, by clinging, but he says it's through giving. Give and it shall be given unto you, press, good measure, pressed down and shaken together. And running over shall men gather into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Here's still another one from Mark chapter 9, verse 35. And he sat down and called the twelve and said unto them, now listen to this, if any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. Now doesn't that seem strange to the natural mind? The first, last, and the last will be first. A contradiction seemingly, but very, very true. Now, there are several of these uh, seemingly contradictory statements or unusual statements regarding the birth of Christ, regarding his incarnation, God becoming a man. For example, how and why would the God of the universe, the king of the universe, choose to be born on planet earth? Uh, Luke's account begins with imperial Rome, Caesar Augustus, and ends with a stable. Quite a paradox. Uh, from the king of glory to be born in a stable. Paul gives us another one in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. He was rich, yet he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. Doesn't that seem uh, unnatural? Doesn't that seem contradictory to the natural mind that someone through their poverty might make someone else rich? Now, even one of Jesus' titles 
or name seems to be almost contradictory. Matthew 1, 23, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. He's quoting from the prophecy of Isaiah, which being interpreted is God with us. So he's the son of a human virgin, yet God with us. How can that be? Uh, one of our Assemblies of God missionaries that uh, we support here from this church is Gary Ellison. Uh, he and Lori are in Vanuatu. But at some point or other, I, I copied this down, something that he'd posted perhaps. But he speaks of the incarnation, the miracle of God becoming man. He says, the incarnation is by far the most amazing miracle of the entire Bible. Far more amazing than the resurrection and more amazing than even the creation of the universe. The fact that the infinite, omnipotent, eternal Son of God could become man and join himself to a human nature forever so that infinite God became one person with finite man will remain forever, for eternity, the most profound miracle and the most profound mystery in all the universe. Thank you, Brother uh, Gary, for those words, those are beautiful words. Now, let's look at some of the, the what may seem like paradoxical statements regarding the, the birth of Christ. Jesus was welcomed by shepherds so that we could be welcomed by angels. Now think of it, the king of the universe and every other universe that's out there. Uh, when we think of the entirety of creation, we think of the universe. There may be things out there that we cannot even comprehend. But let me tell you, if they're out there, I know the one that created them. The king of all that is was welcomed by lowly shepherds. Lowly shepherds welcoming the king of the universe. What a paradox, yet true. Now, many of the great men of the Bible spent at least a part of their lives as shepherds. David, Moses are examples that come to mind. Amazingly, our Heavenly Father in Luke 23 is depicted as a shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Jesus Christ himself is described in John 10 as the good shepherd. He's uh, contrasted with the hireling because the good shepherd has an interest in the sheep. Uh, the good shepherd is willing to give his life. It's not just a job with him. And of course, Jesus, as the good shepherd, did give his life for the sheep. Now, in spite of all of these wonderful things about shepherds in the Old Testament especially, by the time of Jesus, shepherds were not held in high regard, I'm told. Uh, some considered them ceremonially unclean, uh, having a bad reputation, uh, being very lowly, very low on the social scale, so to speak. But Jesus, when he was born, was welcomed not by the big names or the elite of the community, but by simple shepherds. Think of who was not there. Obviously, there were no television cameras there in that day to make a media circus out of his birth. There were no politicians there trying to make a photo op. Uh, no foreign diplomats came to see him with, you might think of the exception of the Magi, but they came much later. The Bible only speaks of one visitor or one group of visitors that came to see Jesus the night he was born, the lowly shepherds. And this was all a part of Jesus humbling himself. He humbled himself and became fully human. Humble in his birth, humble in his life, humble in his death, but now exalted King of kings and Lord of lords. He humbled himself and came to this old world, and because he did, I have the anticipation that when I leave this world, I'll be ushered by the angels, holy angels, into the presence of God. His first coming was unnoticed except for a few individuals. His second coming will not be in obscurity. It will be glorious in power and glory. Many times over the years, I have been present as a pastor uh, when some child of God has gone into eternity. And for some, there are just a few there. For others, an entire family is around. Sometimes it's a very glorious, wonderful experience. The Bible says precious in the sight or the eyes of the Lord is the death of his saints. Other times it's very quiet and seemingly unnoticed, but no child of God is ever alone at the time of their death. When I leave here, it will not be an obscurity, but it will be a glorious home going because of what Jesus did for me. Because he came and humbled himself 
when I leave this world, I know it's going to be a glorious entrance into the presence of God. Jesus had a natural birth so that I could have a supernatural birth. Now think about it. The king of the universe experienced a very lowly natural birth so that I could experience what the Bible calls being born again, a supernatural birth, being born again by the Spirit of God. That's indeed a paradox to the natural mind. In fact, I think of when Jesus introduced the concept of being born again to Nicodemus. Nicodemus didn't answer, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb? And Jesus made it very clear he's speaking of a spiritual birth. Now, when it comes to the birth of Christ, his mother Mary, there are those among our Catholic friends who have elevated Mary. Some uh, in this day or have even elevated her to the level of a co-redeemer along with Jesus Christ. But you know, Jesus Christ is the only one who ever came into the world that did not need a savior. Mary herself in Luke 147 declared her own need of a savior. She's not a savior. She stands in need of a savior. Even as wonderful and godly as she was, even as the Bible said, the most blessed among women, she still needed a savior. Once in a while, you'll hear of some uh, idol of Mary in some church somewhere that is supposedly weeping, shedding tears, and, and there'll be tons of people that will go and, and they will uh, worship or nearly worship that image. But I saw a tract one time, why is Mary weeping? And she was weeping because she was being worshiped instead of her son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's one extreme, but you know, think about it. Think how wonderful it was that this woman a simple human being, when she carried that baby in her womb, she was carrying not just her creator, but the creator of the universe, and not just the universe, all that is the king of everything in her womb. When she held that baby to her breast and fed him, she was bringing nourishment to the king of the universe. That baby that was born is the only redeemer of mankind. He is the only intermediary. The Bible tells us there's one God and one mediator between men and God, the man, Jesus Christ. Friends, do not believe the lie that you need some other mediator, that you need one of the saints, that you need the Virgin Mary. The Bible makes it very clear. Don't settle for any other mediator except the one true mediator, Jesus Christ. Jesus said you must be born again in John 3. He repeated it in John 3, 7. You must be born again. Jesus was born a simple, uh, in a simple, humble stable. He was born just as any other human being is born, but he did so in order that you and I could be born again. And if you've not been born again by the Spirit of God, if you have just settled for natural birth, Someone said, if you're only born once, you'll die twice. And of course, that means physical death and the second death, the Bible calls it, separation from God in hell. But if you're born twice, that is your natural birth. Uh, I was born August the 9th, 1961 to my mother. But I still had to be born again. And uh, sometime, I believe it was about 1977, I was born again by the Spirit of God. Thank God for a new birth. That new birth is only possible because Jesus came to this earth and gave his life. Praise his holy name forever. So one of the paradoxes of the whole story is that Jesus Christ came to earth and experienced a human birth that I might experience a heavenly birth. Now here's another. Jesus occupied a stable so one day I could occupy a mansion. Now, if anyone should occupy a lowly place, it should be fallen human beings. If anyone should dwell in heavenly glory, it should obviously be the King of glory, the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet he humbled himself, he emptied himself, is one translation of, uh, of the scripture, and came to this earth. And yet he promises us, those who are his people, his children, in John 14, 1, he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. King James says mansions. It's literally dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you so. I go to prepare a place for you. He's preparing a place 
for us, a dwelling place, a, a, a place where we'll live eternally in the presence of God. Isn't that what Psalm 23 says? I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Friends, when I think of a mansion, I don't know about you, but I, I don't necessarily get all excited about a, a big, huge, beautiful home. And the fact that I'll be living in the presence of my Savior, that will make it heaven. But he left that wonderful, glorious, glorious place. Now, think about where he was born. The stable was not a pleasant place. Uh, don't think of it as a beautiful place with the scent of new mown hay. Uh, it had all of the sights, sounds, and yes, smells of any stable. Uh, you know, those of us who've been away from the farm any length of time may have forgotten all of those sights, sounds, and yes, smells. Sometimes we've become so far removed from that, but a very humble place. Very, very humble surroundings. You know, Iris Stanfield once wrote, uh, I've got a mansion over the hilltop. And I do. I do. But it's made possible because Jesus humbled himself and was born in that lowly manger, lived a perfect holy life, and ultimately gave his life for me. Can you see? Praise the Lord. He left the portals of glory. One songwriter put it this way. He left those ivory palaces to come to this world of woe. How could it be? Why would it be? It's a paradox. It's a mystery. But I rejoice in it today, friend. Jesus had an earthly mother so that you could know what it is to have a heavenly father. Now, Jesus took upon himself humanity. He's not half God and half man. He's fully God, fully man. Through Jesus Christ becoming a man and dwelling among, among us, we can find salvation and come to God the Father now as, as his children. Some people have the idea that all people in the world are God's children. Friends, that's simply not true. They're God's children in the sense that he loves them. They're God's children in the sense that he's, he created them. But we don't truly become God's children until we are born again. That's why Jesus said to some very religious folks, you are of your father the devil. Until we're born again, that is our spiritual state. But there's a teaching the Bible says, as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. The teaching of the word of God is that you must become a child of God. And you can only do that because of what Jesus did. And I tell you what, when we get a hold of that, what it is to be a child of God, you know, we pray the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven. Friend, if you could just get a hold of what it is to have him as your father. And then there's Matthew 7, 11. If you being evil know how to give good things unto your children, how much more will your heavenly father give good things to them that ask him? Uh, the Bible uses that word Abba. We, we cry out to him, Abba, Father. You know, that most intimate term between a father and child of that day. Uh, Romans 8 says we've not received the spirit of adoption or the spirit of bondage rather, Again, to fear, but we've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit of God makes that relationship real. So as amazing as it seems, what a paradox it is, what a mystery it is, how difficult to fathom, but it's so very true. He came to this earth, became the child of a human mother, raised upon this earth so that one day you and I could become the children of God. Oh, the Bible even says that we are heirs of God, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Friends, if you can understand that, if you can fathom that, uh, you're further along than I am. I, I can't even imagine, but I know it's true. Praise God for the truth of the word of God. Praise his name forever. Jesus also became subject to the limitations of planet Earth, the limitations of humanity, so that one day I could be free from all limitations. Uh, Philippians 2 and 7 gives us these words. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. There's another one of those paradoxes. How could a king become a servant? But he did. A king became a servant so that one day servants of sin could be born again and one day rule and reign with him. Uh, myster mysterious, difficult to comprehend, but very real. He was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even unto the death of the cross. And it goes on to say, now he's been given a name which is above every name. 
But he humbled himself. He took upon all the limitations of, of a human body. Jesus experienced uh, weakness. He, he experienced pain. He experienced all of those things, tears and sorrow. He experienced death itself for us. He was tempted, the Bible says, in all points like as we are. He, he knew everything that it is to have a, a human body. And when he conquered death, hell, and the grave, he opened a way for you and I to walk free one day from the limitations of planet Earth. This old body that you and I are living in one day is going to breathe its last. Uh, from the very moment that I was born, a time clock began ticking away, and there is a time appointed when I'm going to leave this world. But one day, I believe I'm going to have a new incorruptible body free from all of the limitations of sin and death and planet Earth. And that's only made possible because Jesus took upon himself humanity and came to this world and gave his life. Can you say praise the Lord forever? Jesus left heavenly glory so that I could share in that glory one day. You know, the Bible says here on earth he'll not share his glory with another, but we're going to be living in that glory. Uh, Isaiah saw part of his glory in Isaiah 6. Uh, he saw the Lord high and lifted up his train, filling the temple. And Isaiah's response was to say, Lord, woe is me. I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Three of Jesus' disciples, Peter, James, and John, saw a glimpse of his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus prayed in John 17, 5, Father, glorify Thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Romans 8, 17. If children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we also may be glorified together. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. We're being changed from glory to glory. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 6 speaks of earlier how the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of those that believe not. And it's in order that he says that God has commanded the light to shine out of the darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Satan wants to blind you to that, but God wants to reveal to you the glory of Jesus Christ. Uh, Ephesians 3.16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. And we could go on and on and on. All of these scriptures that deal with the glory of the Savior. The glory of the Savior. And you can get your concordance out if you've got one. And look up in the New Testament all those scriptures that speak of his glory. He left heavenly glory and came to this earth because of his great love for humanity. And, and even that love is a mystery to me. I can't imagine why he would love me. If you really knew me, you probably wouldn't like me, let alone love me. But Jesus knows everything about me and still loves me. He became a servant so that one day I could become a king. I could rule and reign with him. Daniel 7 uh, speaks of that prophetically, looking forward. This was before Jesus ever came into the world. But he says, And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. That's you and me whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. So the king of the universe, friend, left heavenly glory so that one day I could leave this planet and live in that glory with him. I one day will rule and reign with Jesus and friends there again. That's a mystery that's hard for me to comprehend why or how or what it will be like. But friends, it's very, very true, paradox or not. And last but not least, Jesus came where we are so we could go where he is. Where is heaven? I can remember some years ago, I was walking through a grocery store and saw one of these tabloid magazines that they often have near the checkout. And they had a photo on there and it claimed to be a photo of the new Jerusalem coming down from God out, out of heaven. And uh, obviously I know that that wasn't a picture of the new Jerusalem. Uh, I know the new Jerusalem is going to be my eternal home, uh, but believe you me, no camera of the National Enquirer has taken a picture of it. But then I know that there are others. I remember one time it was said that some of the Soviet Union's cosmonauts went out into space and, uh, you know, that from that very atheistic society at that time and said, you know, we, we were out there in space. We never saw God. We never saw heaven. And somehow they 
uh, had the idea that that would make people believe that because they hadn't seen it, it, it wasn't there. Friends, uh, you're not going to see it with these physical eyes. It's greater, more, more glorious than that. And just think how big this universe is. Uh, it's so big that there's no telescope big enough to, to scratch the surface of its vastness. Uh, the light from the, the sun, the closest star to planet Earth, 93 million miles away, it takes eight minutes to get here. If one day God would decide to shut off the switch of the sun, we would not know for eight minutes. There are stars that are so far away that that light traveling at 186,000 miles a minute, a, a second rather, takes not minutes or seconds to get here, but years. The vastness of the universe, the smallness of planet Earth, the sun is so large that if it were a goldfish bowl and the Earth were BBs, you could drop a million BBs the size of the Earth into that goldfish bowl to fill it. And they're untold millions, trillions, billions, numbers that we can't comprehend of suns, of stars out there. Uh, Psalm 147 says, God's knowledge is infinite. He, he numbers the stars. He calleth them all by their names. And yet when I think of planet Earth, we, we realize that planet Earth is just a tiny, tiny speck. We visited the Creation Museum one time and they have a planetarium and it was very interesting to lie back and see that depiction of the heavens above and, and they sort of took you out in outer space so to speak and you could see the earth become smaller and smaller and soon uh, the sun was just a tiny little dot and soon you were further out and then you could see the Milky Way galaxy is just a tiny little pinprick and here you're going further and further out and, and you know to see the greatness of that in, in the whole scheme of things planet earth is but a speck of dust. And the Bible says that human beings, Adam and Eve, and basically all of us since then by our descent from him, are created from that same dust or dirt. So you can't get much more lowly than that to be living on a speck of dust and to be created with some of that very dust. And yet creator God himself takes an interest in this planet. Not just an interest in this planet, but chose to create beings here in his own image and likeness, choose to come and die, become a human being, live as one of those creatures of dust, and live and die on this planet, giving his life for those beings. And, you know, it's while we were yet sinners, he didn't give his life for those who loved him. He gave his life for sinners and those who rejected him. He gave his life for those who cursed his name, uh, for those who have blasphemed him. He gave his life for you. He did all of that. He left the glories of heaven to come to this tiny little speck. Oh, friends, that, that boggles my mind. It boggles my mind to think about, but I rejoice today. Because he did that, someday the Bible says, and this is 1 John 3, here's something else that should boggle your mind. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but when he appears, we shall be like him. One day... He became like me, but one day I'm going to become like him and I will see him as he is. Now, just imagine uh, we spoke of the greatness of the universe. I could not uh, face, you know, eight inches away from the sun. I would be incinerated. I, I couldn't stand in the presence of, of God uh, with my body as it is. But one day I'm going to have a new body, new eyes, new ears, new senses, and I'm going to, to be like him and I'm going to see him as he truly is. And that's only made possible because of the glorious miracle of the incarnation, God came to earth and became a man. He left earth and went back to heaven, but one day he's going to come back to earth and he's going to take me to heaven. One day he's going to come for me. He says, I'll come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. So amazing, unfathomable, paradoxical, if you will, but very true. The Gospel of Luke is not, of course, the end of the story. Uh, we don't want to uh, worship the little baby lying in a manger, nor do we worship Jesus that's still hanging on a cross, hanging on a crucifix. We worship the one who is seated at the Father's right hand, soon to appear, returning to earth to judge the living and the dead. Uh, we, we see in the book of Revelation that he is King of kings and Lord of lords, that one day all of the kingdoms of this planet will have become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ 
and he'll reign forever and ever and ever. So friends, it's, it's more than just the cry of a little baby. It's all about eternity. It's all about a great plan. Are you a part of that great plan? I want you to know that Jesus came to this earth because he loved you. He came to this earth because he wants you to be saved. He came to this earth because he wants you to have the hope of eternal life. If you've never received the Lord Jesus Christ today, today would be a wonderful day for you to do it. God offers you a gift. Receive that gift. This is the season of gift giving. Just as you would receive a gift from someone that, that loves you here on earth, receive a gift today from someone who loves you infinitely. You say, well, I don't understand it. Friends, I don't understand all of it either, but I relish it. I, I rejoice in it. He said, if you'll call on the name of the Lord, you can be saved. So why don't you call out to Jesus today, right now? Say, Lord Jesus, I want to receive the great gift that you've given me, that gift of everlasting life. Let's pray today. Can, can you do that with me? If you've never been born again, what a wonderful day. You could mark this down. I received the best gift I ever received. December 24th, 2023, I received the gift of eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the, the mystery, Lord God, the wonder, the miracle of God becoming human flesh and dwelling among us. Lord, we, we think of all of the implications of that in our own life. But Lord, we rejoice today that your word says, as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. Lord, I pray that if any listening today that have never received that gift, Lord, that they would remember that your word says the wages of sin is death, Lord God. And we realize, Father, that that death means not just physical death, but spiritual death, separation from God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And Lord, though I don't understand everything about it, Lord, I believe that Jesus came to this earth because he loved me. I believe that he humbled himself, became a human being. He died on the cross. Oh, I deserve to be there, Father, but I thank you that Jesus died in my place. I believe that he rose again. And Lord, I want to make him the king and the Lord of my life. And by faith, I receive that gift of eternal life today in Jesus' name. Lord, help me to give you all the glory and the honor and the praise forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, praise the Lord. May Jesus Christ, the Son of God, fill you with all the glory and wonder of his presence today, tomorrow, and all the endless tomorrows of eternity. In Jesus' name, amen.